Bibles are ready, let's get ready and share a little bit of the Word of God tonight. How many of you love the Word of God? Now make sure that if you say you love the Lord and His Word and you love that Word like you say you do, make sure that you really mean it. Amen. I've met a lot of times over the years and seen where that people love a certain novel or a certain hobby or a certain series of movie or a certain whatever. And boy, they really, they, as much as you can carnally love something, they really love it. But when you say you love the Word of God, what does that say for your daily walk? Amen. Well, the last couple of weeks... I have already preached on, I'll get around to it. I preached on, if not now, when. And tonight, I'm going to preach on the price of waiting. If you have your Bible tonight, I've already used this text already. And I just can't get away from this, and I have to obey the Lord tonight. So 1 Kings chapter 18, we're going to read this verse again. We preached from this the other day. Uh, it's not a very common thing that you hear Brother Myers preach from the same text in close proximity to the recently preaching something. That's not something that happens very often, but um, here you go tonight. We appreciate you. Appreciate all the folks who listen by the Internet. Just thank God for his provision tonight and the ability to hear the word. I never know there may be someone traveling down the road tonight or someone sitting at home listening to the Internet. And uh, this message is just what they need to hear. God's got a word for you. God's got a word for someone else. First Kings chapter 18, verse 21, if you have it, say amen. The Bible said, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long? Halt ye between two opinions. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. That feels like we just preached from that yesterday, doesn't it? Let's read it one more time. It's just one verse. I want you to really grasp a hold of what the man of God is saying here. Elijah came unto all the people. And said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Stretch your hand to the Lord tonight. Pray for the will of God in this service. Lamb of God, we come before your presence again tonight. We're asking you to just have your way, Lord. I pray, God, that you will speak to us in this service. Lord, there are people that need a word from God, something fresh from the Master's hand. And I pray, God, that you will use me to say exactly what they need to hear under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And everyone can say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I said already, we have preached in the last few weeks uh, on the in a in a close proximity of services, if you will, on I'll get around to it, which was one uh, message that God had laid on my heart to preach about, and then I preached another message on if not now, when that was pretty recent, and then tonight preaching with the will of God on the price of waiting. Now, when the Lord put this on my heart, it, it was kind of like, you know, I don't like to preach the same thing or something very similar too much because sometimes people, ah, they, they, don't, they like something brand new every service. But in some way, this is brand new, but it's along the same line of what God's been trying to say to us. But to me tonight, it's apparent that the Lord is trying to tell you and I something. Because when I look at the last few weeks and he's dealt or led me to preach on these messages concerning some of the very same topics or subject or theme, if you will, on procrastination and sometimes our indecisiveness and our lack of forward motion 
in our life to do the will of God. So I don't take this lightly by any means. You may say, well, it's Thursday night. You know, if we had more people, we could take this service more seriously. That's, that's carnal, folks. Uh, we ought to be able to just take the Word of God at face value and what the Lord gives us. But I take these messages very seriously because I feel like tonight uh, that God must be trying to tell us something by continually telling us or giving us messages that have the same basic principle about procrastination, this indecisive back and forth, and uh, our lack of forward motion, and tonight preaching to the will of God on the price of waiting. So obviously I believe tonight God's trying to tell us something. If you believe that, say amen. Because a lot of times, you know, I think about uh, when God lays these messages on our heart, and especially given this uh, into account of all of this, it makes me wonder just how many times does God have to tell us something to get our attention? I want you to think about that for just a few minutes. Imagine if God came to you and on maybe a, a Friday night and God said, I want you to do a certain thing. And then so you don't do what God tells you to do or maybe you don't take it very seriously. It goes in one ear and out the other. Then God comes back to you on Saturday night and God says the very same thing. And well, you know, you really don't take it as serious. Then God comes back on Sunday night and God says, hey, by the way, and God tells you the same thing. I don't know about you, but it don't take a, a brain surgeon for you to be able to understand that God's trying to get your attention and my attention to tell us to do something or to show us a particular thing. So obviously tonight, waiting, when we think about waiting, that waiting in itself, it can be a good thing. I don't ever want you to get the idea that when I talk about the price of waiting and uh, what can happen, if, you, if you're waiting around and you don't do the will of God. I don't want you to think that it's always bad because in truth there are some times that we have to wait on God. Say amen somebody. I cannot preach this without preaching both sides of it so I'm just gonna uh, tarry here for just a little while. But when you look in the word of God you can see where the, the Bible shows us Job who says these very words, I will wait till my change comes. Job was in a place of his life that he knew that God had a plan for him and Job says I will wait but Job saying I'm going to wait till my change comes was more or less Job saying I'm not going to get ahead of God I'm not going to do something out of the will of God I'm going to wait until my change comes I'm not going to sell out to the devil I'm not going to quit serving God I'm not going to charge God foolishly I'm not going to fall out of the race I'm going to wait till my change comes and so we see Job saying that he's willing to do some waiting and it was a good thing for Job in the book of Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31 and the Bible said they that wait upon the Lord and you know the Bible tells us they're going to mount up with wings as eagles and so the Bible shows us that there are times that you and I must wait on God and if we do we're going to mount up with wings as eagles and we're going to soar above all the problems and the circumstances that surround us. So there are times that you and I are going to have to wait if we're going to mount up with wings as eagles. When we look at David, David, the psalmist advised us in the book of Psalm chapter 37 and verse 7, he said, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him, fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. And so the psalmist was encouraging you to wait patiently on the Lord because there's some things uh, as it was with Job, if you're not careful and you're not waiting on God to give you an answer, God to show you direction, uh, if you're not careful, it is easy to mess things up and get out of the will of God. And so David, the 
psalmist encouraged us to wait patiently on the Lord, amen, for God to come through and answer, amen. But I can tell you tonight that, of course, those that waited on the promise, amen, over in the New Testament for the gift of the promise of the Holy Ghost, uh, that they were also waiting uh, on what God had promised them. And so waiting in their case was a good thing. But God told them to wait. As a matter of fact, God told them to go to Jerusalem and tarry there until they be endued with power that came from on high. And so there's no doubt tonight in my mind that there are times in our walk with God that we must wait. There are times that we gotta take a time out. God said, hey, amen, you've been moving a little too fast. I want you to sit right there and I want you to think about a few things. I'm gonna work my plan over here and in the meantime, I want you to wait until I do a certain thing. And so it's not always a bad thing to wait on God, but you and I must realize that there are times that waiting is not a good thing. And you and I must understand the difference of when God wants us to hang out, when God wants us to wait on his voice, when God wants us to wait on an answer. Because as I've preached already in the last two or three sermons about this topic, amen, sometimes I find that people will use the excuse, well, I'm waiting on God, and they're 80 years old, and they've been waiting since they was 20. And they still ain't done nothing for God. I'm not talking about that. That is foolish, and that is nothing more than a lazy Christian popping up on this. Well, I'm waiting on God, waiting on God to move, waiting on God to tell me something. And in a lot of cases, I have found as a child of God, there is so much work to do. The harvest fields are white and ready for the harvest, and there's so much that you and I can be doing in God that most of the time we're not. Not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. Can you say amen? But you don't have to look very far into the word of God to understand that there were those who paid the price of waiting. If we went back to the book of Genesis, he would find where the Bible shows us about a story that all of us are familiar with. How many remembers Noah? That God gave him the blueprint for a great ark and God used Noah to build an ark. Well, God encouraged Noah to give Get the people on board, but the people waited until God shut the ark door and it was too late. There were those that made fun of Noah. They stood on the outside, they made fun of Noah. And Noah basically let them know the only people that are gonna make it are the ones that get on that ark. Do you know the same thing is happening tonight in churches all across the world? There are preachers that are standing up proclaiming it's time to get in this ark. I preached about it the other day. God has opened up the dispensation of grace for the Gentile people and that is their ark of safety. It's no different than Noah's ark. God said, get in this ark while you still can. And so that's exactly what Noah was trying to tell the people. But you see the people waited around. I remember many years ago when I was an evangelist, I had long been preaching. I remember preaching in Jacksonville, Florida in the first revival that God had given me to preach. And I remember that God had laid a message on my heart. And I remember that I began to preach about how that it must have been whenever those people outside the ark and God shut the door. Can you imagine what it must have been like when the first raindrop fell from heaven? Here they are, they've never seen a raindrop before. Come on, somebody. Can you imagine if you never seen rain? All they saw was a mist of rain or water come up out of the ground. They never saw rain. But whenever that first drop of water came, they probably still looked around, kept making fun of Noah. But I can guarantee you when the water got up to their knees, up to their waist, when the water got up to around their chest and they were holding their babies up in the air to get another breath of air, I can tell you it became real serious. Do you know that we're facing a generation tonight? night that may be making fun of us because we're so excited about the coming of the Lord and we're trying to get folks on this ark of safety but I can tell you waiting around for that generation didn't help nobody and there's going to be folks in this generation that wait around too long and they miss out on the rapture and they 
There's going to be people that are going to miss out. Somebody say, God, help this generation. I've got family that I love tonight. There are people that I, I dread the thought of knowing that they're going to die lost. Do you know that's how we all ought to feel? But do you know that is the price of waiting and waiting and waiting? You see, what people tell themselves is I've got plenty of time. And if that ain't enough, those standing on the outside of the ark, they see, well, Jim, Bob, Jed, and brother whoever and white his face uh, over there they're not getting in on this boat uh, so it must be okay I want you to know some folks just like it was with Noah there came a day brother Benefield the Bible didn't say Noah shut the ark door did it huh? the Bible said that God shut the ark door I can't imagine what a massive door that it must have been when did God use the water that began to rise to shut it you know it really don't matter to me how God did it I just know the word of God said it and I believe it that God shut the door and I remember preaching in that service in a revival just a young evangelist and I remember that I began to beat on the pulpit and I said I can just imagine that there must have been people on the outside uh, that when that ark door shut uh, that they begin to beat on the ark door and say Noah open the door open open the door Noah and I can hear Noah cry back uh, say I didn't shut it uh, and I can't open it uh, there's going to come a day when there's going to be preachers uh, that are going to say I didn't shut it and I can't open it again Somebody say, help us tonight, God. I got family and I got loved ones uh, that are waiting around. And there'll be a day they're going to pay the price for waiting. Can somebody say, God, help them tonight. But they, but in the same thing that happened in Noah's day, it'll happen today. But in Genesis chapter 19, we read how that Lot nearly lost his life. Because in verse 16, the Bible said that Noah lingered behind but the only thing that saved Noah was the grace of God because the Bible said two men that we suppose were angels took Noah or took Lot and his family by the hand and led them out of the city if it wouldn't have been for the angels of God who were there because of Abraham's prayer I can tell you the Bible said that Lot he lingered in other words he waited he lingered he laid around waiting as if he had plenty of time but because of the righteous Abraham God smiled on Abraham's prayer and God used two of those angels to get a hold of Lot and get him out of that city my I feel the Holy Ghost tonight amen but he waited how many's got family waiting? How many's got some family lingering? How many's got, how many knows some folks uh, that are just tearing behind? I want you to know, hey amen, they're gonna pay an awful heavy price if they don't get in while they can. Somebody say, help us, God. Hey amen, but it's not just that. But I read in the book of Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, about the foolish five virgins uh, that I preached about in messages already. But the Bible showed us that them five foolish virgins uh, they put off the maintaining of the oil in their lamp you know we can learn a lot from the five foolish virgins uh, we got a lot of folks tonight hey amen they're going to pay a heavy price because they keep putting it off putting oil in their vessel I'd like to ask every child of God tonight uh, just how much revival have you got in your life how much fire is in your life uh, do you worship like you used to worship do you pray like you used to pray? I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Huh? What are they waiting on? I don't feel like it. There's so many people that are a product of I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. It's going to cause a lot of folks to end up lost when the Lord says, Gabriel, Put your lips to that silver trumpet, brother, and wake up the dead with a holy reveille. Amen. He begins to blow that trumpet. I want you to know it's a sad day because there's going to be a lot of folks uh, that are going to die lost because they ain't ready. My God in heaven, what I'm telling you tonight, 
is there is a big price to pay when you wait when you shouldn't be waiting. Somebody say amen. In the book of Acts, the apostle, the Acts of the Apostles, I read where the, the man of God, Paul, before he was considered the righteous Paul, and we knew him as Saul. He was that one responsible in that day and hour for being able to say, yeah, go to that certain city and wipe out them Christians over there. Go take care of them over there. It was because all he had to do was speak the word or put his name on a piece of paper or a document of parchment and people lost their lives because of Saul. But God, he meant here's a man that thought he was doing God Jehovah a great service by wiping out Christians and having a part of that foolishness. But one day on the Damascus Road, most of you know the story, but one day on that Damascus Road, Saul had a great encounter with God. And I want you to listen to what God God said to Paul because basically what God was saying to Paul when he was saw is what are you waiting on? You sure about that brother Myers? Well Acts 22 and 16 records the account and the Bible said and now why tarriest thou? Arise. This is God talking to Saul who's about to become a saved, sanctified, baptized Paul. He says, and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What I'm telling you is there's a price to pay when we wait. God was calling Paul out but I have to wonder to myself, sometimes I read the word of God and I think, what if? Maybe I shouldn't do that, but it's just a part of who I am, I guess. But a lot of times I think, what would have happened if Paul would have said, not now, Lord. And when God called him out and said, what are you waiting on? What are you tarrying for? I wonder what would have happened, Brother Eric, if, if Paul would have said, well, I got things to do, I'm not ready. I wonder, I mean, Paul went on to write a great majority of the New Testament and a lot of it he wrote from a Roman prison cell while many of his cohorts, his co-laborers in the Lord were being beaten, murdered, martyred for the gospel's sake. Paul sits behind prison cell walls and writes a great deal of the testaments that we today quote from when we're in adversity and the scriptures that we learn from when we're trying to teach the word of God to people, when we're trying to get souls saved. Many of the very letters that the man of God wrote behind prison walls we use for our sermon text and for scriptures when we use it against the, el the devils that are out there and the evil that comes against us. Here he is. But what if when God said, what are you tarrying for? What are you waiting on, Paul? Get up, Saul. What do you look? Get up off the ground. What are you tarrying for? Arise. Confess your sins. Be baptized and have your sins washed away. Call upon the name of the Lord. You see, Paul's story is a great story. And I can tell you that if Paul would not have taken heed to the voice of God, Paul's story wouldn't have been very great. Do you know tonight there are people fulfilling what I have already asked tonight and that is what if? Because there are people that have had God deal with them directly. God has already called them. He's already put a calling on their life to do a certain thing. To live for God and give all their life to God. And yet, when God said, what are you tarrying for? They just ignore God. When I look at my scripture text, I am blown away by the attitude of the people in first kings I already preached it before to you so I'm not going to elaborate a great deal on the scripture 
But I tell you, whenever the Bible said that whenever Elijah called the people in question and he asked them a very simple thing, he said, if God be God, then serve him. And if Baal be God, then serve him. And the Bible said the people answered him not a word. When Paul or when Elijah began to call the people out and, and, and Elijah said, why halt you between two opinions? They had nothing to say. Let me tell you something. I don't, it doesn't matter whether you ignore God or not. That will not, that does not stall God's plan. That does not cause what God said to be in effect because you ignore God, because you don't go to church, because you run from God. Everything God told you that he wanted you to do, I've had people tell me, Pastor Myers, they'd be backslid and tell me when I was a young boy, when I was a young girl, that somebody, a man or woman of God, laid hands on me and I knew that day when a prophet laid their hand on me and told me I was supposed to be a preacher, I was supposed to be preaching and I'm thinking to myself the same thing that God asked Paul on a Damascus road, what are you tarrying for but there are people tonight that are waiting they're waiting and I want you to know as I said earlier there are times you have no choice but to wait usually when God wants you to wait there's usually not a lot of opportunities or doors open on the table as it pertains to God but I have found If you really want to force a door open, the devil will make a way for you. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. When you begin to wait around and God's saying, come on, you will get left behind. And everything God planned to do in your life, God cannot do it. Some of you know Brother John Henry not long after he got saved, began to go to Gray Street Church of God. I still remember him coming, sitting about where Sister Linda is, maybe the, where Brother Eric is, in his Hawaii 5 shirt, and sitting toward the back of the church. He'd come in a little late, leave a little early until we got to know him. And the next thing you know, God began to deal with his life. And I've sat down many a times and talked with Brother John. And Brother John tell me when I was a young man, I sung for the Lord. I was raised in church. I knew God. God wanted me to do something for him. And for 20 something years, he said, I ran from God. I said, my God in heaven, what a shame it is. Can you imagine what 20 something years of ministry, where he'd be today? Thank God he finally accepted the call. But I hear God saying to a lot of folks tonight, what are you tarrying for? Well, I got this career opportunity. I got this thing I want to do, God. I've been, you know, I've got so many things. I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. And There's a whole list of things that the devil will feed you as the reason why you can't do God's way. I ain't got enough money. When I get some more money, when I have a bigger house, when I'm relocated, when I get my GED, when I, when I, when I. I'm going to tell you something. Every one of these messages that I preached on when I get around to it and when I preached on uh, messages about this and procrastination, I'm telling you, God's trying to get people's attention. And you're going to give an account for every message that God intended you to hear and you weren't there to hear it. Amen. I believe that all with all my heart tonight. But I want you to see something tonight just briefly looking at this text. And Elijah, here with the people, the Bible said Elijah came into all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the Bible said the people answered him not a word. Will you give me just a few minutes here? So I want to show you something. I know we talked about that word halt before. And I told you how that myself and other preachers have preached about how that that word halt in the the original it meant hop like a hop from like a bird hopping from branch to branch why hop you in other words why you back and forth but I want to show you one other angle of this word halt when we look at that word halt in the original translation of the Hebrew the word halt comes from the word pasak which means amen to hop to skip over or to hesitate 
I want that to sink in. The man of God, Elijah, says, Why halt you between two opinions? And that original Hebrew word, pasak, that word means to hop, to skip over, or to hesitate. So in other words, Elijah says to the people, why do you hop between two opinions? In other words, Elijah says, why do you skip over two opinions? Or why do you hesitate between two opinions? i tell you tonight, this is the scariest part of the potential lost in the lives of people who God has blessed with talents and gifts to be an effective part of his church. I'm not going to go down and I'm not even going to go there tonight, but I will briefly tell you, there are many throughout the years, Hollywood megastars, big name musicians, movie actors, and the likes who God blessed them somewhere in a little church somewhere to sing, to play an instrument, to be used by God. And they perverted that talent, turned to the things of the world, and used it to bless the world and to be used by the devil. Do you know tonight the sad thing is, is that most every time you watch the tragedy of their life and how their life ends, Drugs, suicide, and many other unfortunate things that happen to them. You cannot sell everything God's called you to do and the talents and the gifts. You cannot sell out to the things of the world and expect there never be a price to pay. You may get money. You may have cars. They may talk about you and use your name. They may create museums in your honor. And it may go on for generations to come. But I want to tell you something. It does not matter if you've got a star on Hollywood's Broadway with your name on it. What the most important thing is that your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. We are living in a carnal day in the church that breaks and saddens my heart. We are living in a day that if somebody feels like they can get another $50 from the church down the road to play the piano every Sunday. They'll leave one church, go to another, because they can make more money down at the other church. Does anybody think that that disgusts you too? Let me tell you something, that's carnal, and God ain't in that. There was a day when people wanted to be spirit-led, and if they went somewhere and never got a dollar added to their pocket, it didn't matter. They say, knew the Bible said, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moss and rust does not corrupt. They knew that their treasure was up in heaven and they could care less if they ever got a dollar. Somebody say amen to me tonight. But why do you hesitate when it comes to salvation and God's will in a person's life? It seems to me that we're seeing a tremendous amount of hesitation and stalling in this day. I am telling you that I could go as far as to say it's an epidemic Not just people that are not saved coming into our churches hesitating when conviction comes down. Stalling when conviction comes down. Walking out of the church house unchanged when conviction comes down. The sad reality is that we've got people that claim to be a child of God, washed in the blood, sanctified, holy, baptized in heaven's Holy Ghost, and yet... They go out of the church and in the church and out of the church and in the church and they ain't no different tonight than they were three years ago. That ain't, that ain't, that was not shouting grounds now, is it? I'll tell you something. A child of God, I know that this ain't popular kind of preaching. And that may be the reason why that my preaching may not appeal to a lot of folks, but I'm not trying to appeal to people. I'm trying to please God and align with the Word of God. But I'll tell you something. Sometimes a child of God has to do a self-audit and they have to look at their life and they have to examine themselves. And the Bible said, let a man examine himself and see if he be in the way. 
In other words, he wasn't talking about being in the way like somebody got in your way. But in other words, are you in the race? Sometimes you've got to examine yourself and find out if, you're, if your motives and if your mission and if you're in the race for the right reason or if you're in the race at all. Huh? Am I still in the fight? Am I just, am I just bearing the honor of the name Christian? Yep, but I'm not fighting in this army like I'm supposed to. And I'm just, when God wants me to do something, I give him a whole list of why I can't do it. You see, I know that Jonah ran the opposite direction. And you see what happened to Jonah. I don't suspect that Jonah planned on doing the will of God at all. But there's something we can say about this story. In comparison to those, as I preached here recently, I'll get around to it. There are some people who will not come right out and tell you they're not going to do it. But their idea or mentality is one day. I don't know I can say that about Jonah. But I can tell you this. The same penalty and price will come. Whenever we continue to put off, put off, put off. Because I can see God whenever we put God off. God does not like to be put off. Because a lot of times the sad thing is that people will say, God use me. God help me. And then when he does... If it's not the job they wanted, if it's not the place they wanted, if it's not the wife they wanted, if it's not the life they wanted, then they draw back upon God. I want to tell you something. You're not in this race to please self. Whenever you got saved, you turned your life over to Christ, and it was all about what pleased Him. And thankfully, God... His priority. Can you say amen? So as I've already preached using this same verse with explanation about Elijah, it's basically Elijah trying to find out that is really, if you get right down to what Elijah is trying to find out, what he's trying to find out. God is basically wanting to know the same thing. When he looks at Saul on the Damascus road, why tarriest thou? What are you waiting on? You know who I am now. I've shown myself to you. Do you realize that that encounter with God on the Damascus road, I seriously doubt, Sister Miranda, that it was a 24-hour ordeal. I really seriously doubt that it went on for days in one place in the middle of the road. Most likely, when God, in that short amount of time, and that short amount of verses and what God said, God didn't read a book to uh, Saul, but God was simple, God was direct, and God got the point across. I would venture to say that everything that took place that day took place within at least a 30-minute to an hour window. You're telling me that there's all probability that this happened within at least 30 minutes to an hour's time, possibly, and God's already asking the question, why tarriest thou? God, you just, you, we just seen each other 29 minutes ago. What you mean, why am I tarrying? Because God understands, Brother Eric, the urgency of the hour when we don't. God understands that the gifts and the talents he's blessed us with, that there are people that need that. Not because you're somebody, but because God will use you for his own purpose and glory. So we've just met God. We've just, you just talked, you just shown yourself to me, God. And God's saying, right in that short amount of time, why tarriest thou? Because God knew the urgency of the hour and God knew that Saul needed to get up now that he's Paul and he needed to obey God and do what Paul, Paul was supposed to do. 
That don't seem like enough time, Brother Myers. We're not working on my timetable or yours. We're working on God's timetable. Somebody say amen tonight. So here's what I want us to see. The cost for failure to do the work of the Lord now, right now, there's at least four different things that the Holy Ghost has shown me. But I want you to see there's going to come a time when we cannot work for God. You sure? Well, first of all, I want you to see tonight in John 9 and 4, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while his day, the night cometh when no man can work. If you and I will not work and obey God right now when the door of opportunity is open, you know where I'm going, don't you? You got full opportunity. You can walk out of the church tonight and go to Walmart or go down to some other place where there are people at. Just start witnessing to people if you wanted to. The sky is the limit, as they say, as to the opportunities out there in the world because the harvest is plenteous. And so we'll not obey God and work for God now when all the doors of opportunity are open. What leads you to believe tonight that whenever we've got to put forth an incredible effort to work in a day when we're restrained that we're going to do it? If you won't do it now. Because folks, it is only going to get more and more difficult. The older we get, the more difficult it is to get around. The farther we go, the more our government is suppressing the ability to do what Christians have always done and to be able to have the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion and to freely share that with other people. It's got to the point that over the years, there's a lot of folks that got in church, got in ministry because of some math teacher somewhere that was a believer who shared their faith. Nowadays, you can't coach a football team and lead your team in prayer without somebody wanting to throw you in a courtroom somewhere. I'm telling you, if you can't do it while the doors are open, what makes us think we're gonna do it whenever there's incredible effort and a time when we're restrained to do the will of God? Somebody say, help us tonight, God. But Paul's message to the Corinthians was this. Now I want you to listen to this. Don't let the sacrifices that have been made to deliver God's grace to you go in vain. That's my own commentary. If I had to summarize what Paul was trying to tell them, don't let the sacrifices that have been made to deliver God's grace to you go in vain. You know, folks, there are a lot of folks that have died along the way for this, that we are able to come every Thursday night Right? This is what the lives, not just Jesus, that in itself was worth it all. The blood of all the martyrs along the way. And this is how much emphasis we put on being a child of God. If it don't fit our fancy, or we might lose an hour or two of sleep. Huh? Yet one little thing I saw today, and I've known about a lot of this, but out of all those great apostles of the Word of God, from the best of historical knowledge, only one did not die a martyr. Though they tried to, and that was John the Revelator. The Bible said he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. They put him on the island after they put him in boiling oil. That didn't kill him. So when he got off that island, he later went on to pastor a church. And he's the only one of the the apostles that, that historically recorded that did not die a martyr's death. There were those that were crucified upside down. Those that were beat with a whip until that their body was so lacerated that their entrails hung out. There were those, one man that they pushed him off of a, a high, I think it was a hundred foot cliff. And whenever they realized he survived, they came to his side and clubbed him to death. And yet, we cannot lose an hour or two of sleep. Or yet, that's our Sundays, that's the only day I get off. Yet, we use so many excuses and we've excused God to death and yet the word of God shows us that God wants to ask the question to the church what are you waiting on? 
all the little feeble excuses we use here in America, yet we're probably one of the most blessed generations there ever was, and yet we are the most complaining. I guess the only other generation I can think of that complains as much as the American people of our day might be the people who died in the wilderness for all their complaining. Say, help us tonight, God. But here's what the Bible says. And this is how I get what Paul said from that, 2 Corinthians 6 and 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You see, he wanted the people to hold in their idea, their mind, the sacrifices. I'm succoring you. I'm trying to convince you. I'm trying to get you to understand what's at stake. There's a price to pay for waiting in our own lives. Four things, and I'm going to preach these four things with the help of the Lord, and I'm done. Number one, the first price of waiting in our own lives is the unnecessary damage we experience often also those close to us while we're out of God's will and favor. I've shared with you in the past, and we'll say it again tonight. When Jonah got out of the will of God, it wasn't Jonah, he wasn't the only one that suffered. Jonah was on board a ship. And everybody else that was on that ship that he was on they had to suffer through the rain and the winds and the storm and the ship rocking back and to and fro. They experienced some of the same violent raging of the storm winds and water in that ship. And I guarantee you those seasoned men, they knew something wasn't right. Is the reason why they said God is angry with us. Here are men that have been, they were mariners. They were seasoned men of the water. And they knew something wasn't right. Those men suffered on account of the fact that that man got out of the will of God. Do you know the sad part and the price of waiting in our own lives is that unnecessary damage that you and I experience and often the people that are close to us because we're waiting and we're tearing, we're hesitating. You know, we're lagging behind. We're not ready to do the will of God. You know, sometimes we think it's all about us when it really isn't all about us. My wife and I have often talked about this in the past. I remember being at Mayaka City Church of God and I remember feeling within myself that it was time for me to go as a pastor. I've never wanted to be a kind of pastor that's here a little while, there a little while, which is why I've been here almost nine years. But I knew God was dealing with me. And you know something, Sister Reba? There were times that I tried to talk to myself and convince myself, well, maybe it's just not time to go. And I honestly mean, when I say this to you, I really mean this. I love the people that were there. I did. I loved them so much that whenever the floor fell through in the parsonage and I called the church of God, talked to my overseer, we talked to the head overseer of the state of Florida, and they were talking about closing the church down. I told them, I said, we don't have a lot of money here. I said, but I will be willing. It was a huge, ridiculous task. And I didn't get a lot of help from folks in the church. But I had to completely tear the floor out in a mobile home, out from underneath the walls. Never done this before. I know about construction and carpentry. Been in it most all my life. But I've never done anything like this. And I was willing to do that because I love the people. But to make my point, here's this. I knew, Sister Reba, God wanted me to leave. And there were times that I thought to myself, what will happen to the church if I leave? What will happen to the people? And how's this going to turn out? And I don't want nobody to get their feelings hurt. And I this and I that. The thing is, I had to understand that when God has a plan and God is ushering you to do something, just like he did when Elijah was down there at the brook Cherith, and he said, I'm going to send the ravens to feed you and all of this. And whenever the Bible said there came a time that the brook dried up, and God said, now... 
arise and go to Zarephath because there's a need over there. Well, I'd rather stay right here at the brook Cherith. But when God is ushering you to do His perfect will in a certain way, all of the things that you worry about, you could quit worrying because if God tells you, God deals with you. God has a plan in place already. What are you saying, Brother Myers? Well, let me make it clear to you. When God laid it on my heart, it was a very difficult decision for me to stand up in front of the church. I promised the people at Micah City Church of God. I said, if I ever leave this church, I will not do you like the previous pastors. I made that promise whenever I went there. Because that's what everybody wanted to know. How long are you going to be here? The last couple pastors, they just leave. They'll get up in the pulpit and they say, we're going to be gone. They're gone like the next day. And they're pulling out of the parking lot and leave us high and dry. But I told the church, I went to them and I told them that I was going to be leaving. But some strange way, God gave me a peace about this thing. It wasn't easy. But I'm going to tell you the last message that I preached. God really showed up and showed out, if you want to say it that way. The Holy Ghost gave out a message. And I want to tell you something. There's a lot of times I've been in church services and I've heard some messages given out and some that just about make you want to just crawl underneath a pew somewhere. Just make your hair stand up on the back of your neck. And I want to tell you, God spoke to the church that day and God basically, it's been years, so I don't remember exact verbatim, but basically God was saying, don't worry about a thing. I will take care of you. If you'll be faithful to me, I have a plan. I want to tell you something, folks. I left there. I came here to pastor. I've been here almost nine years. Right directly after that service, God sent Brother Brad Stidham there. And Brother Brad Stidham has been there as long as I've been here. And since they were there, they were a whole lot more successful as far as being able to get people to come and stay in that than I was. I wasn't from that area. I don't know if that's the reason, but Brother Brad's lived there most all of his life. He stuck there. He stayed there. The people came. They've been, they've done a good job there. I'm very proud. Uh, and Brother Brad told me at one time, he said, Brother Myers, he said, the way that God did that thing was so beautiful. He said, in other words, everything that I had done when I was there was like, Brother Brad stepped right in, just kept trucking right along. So let me tell you tonight, you you can never underestimate God. If God tells you to do something, you will suffer and the people around you will suffer and there will be a lot of unnecessary damage if you don't obey God. Say amen to me, somebody. Number two, the price of waiting, the souls that are affected by what we do or don't do. You know, think about this, folks. When you wait around and you tarry on God and you don't accept God and do the will of God, I'm just going to give you a real simple example. Think about the parents, and I've ran into a lot of them, who would come to me and say, Brother Myers, I fell out of church. I raised my kids to live an ungodly lifestyle. I lived unrighteous before them. Now I'm older. Now I'm trying to serve God. And now with me trying to tell them what's right, I lived this wrong way so long, they don't want to listen to me. They don't want to hear what I have to say because they watched me for the majority of my life live one way. And now I'm trying to live right and tell them what's right. And now I'm watching them do the very things that I did all these years while I was away from God. Do you understand? When you wait and you don't do the will of God, how many people are affected by what you don't do? You may think it's strange to look at it this way, but God has such a beautiful, perfect plan. And when we follow that plan, everything falls right into place. Do you know... You wouldn't be sitting on that pew if whenever someone called me on the phone and said, Brother Myers, will you preach this revival? You wouldn't be sitting on that pew most likely if somebody didn't hear the voice of God say, Oh, ask Joe Myers to come and preach. 
There are so many different things that had to fall into place, like, you know, just so perfectly for that to happen. And so God, when he does things, people have to listen to the voice of God. But when people do not obey the voice of the Lord and they don't move when God says to move, folks, souls, people are affected. Number three thing, the price that we pay whenever we're not obeying God, the great experiences we miss out on. You know, it's easy to focus in on all the negative things. We miss God and we, we went through this and we were in jail or we what, whatever. But let's not, think, let's not fail to think about when you don't listen to the voice of God, all the great things you missed. In 1997, August of 1997, if I would not have made that trip to the altar, Sister Myers, I may never have got to experience watching my children on the platform singing for the Lord, doing great things. The people that we have watched get the Holy Ghost, get saved in our ministry, the lives we've been able to touch. Probably none of that would have ever happened. And if it would have, it would have been put off for many years. The camp meetings, the youth camps. Since I've been saved, I've experienced some things I wouldn't trade for nothing in this world. I have felt God so strong in some church service. I could sit here and tell you about some services that I have been a part of, that I was blessed of God to be a part of. I wouldn't trade for nothing in this world. And if it was up to me, we'd be like that every time we came to church. Do you know when you don't obey God and you don't follow after the will of God, you miss out on a whole lot of stuff, a lot of great things. What about that youth pastor that's running from God? All the great experiences and the little smile on some little kid's face when they got picked up to come to church. Or that little girl that they led to the Lord one Sunday morning that they were working with in class. They missed out on that. They didn't get to experience it. Or that time they got up and sang that song they were working on and somebody came down to the altar and gave their life to God. You know, there's so many things that you're going to miss out on, the great experiences that you're going to miss out on if you're, if you're just hesitating and you're halting and you're thinking, well, maybe some other time. The number four thing, there's always the possibility that you may wait so long that you miss your window of opportunity. There are some people that they have, I'll get around to it one day, one day, one day, until one day never came. Miranda, do you want to come to the piano for me tonight? <laughs> I've met a few in my lifetime, people that kept saying, I'm going to one day do this. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to obey the Lord. God's been dealing with me. God's, I'm waiting on the right timing. 20, 30 years later, I'm waiting on the right timing. When in truth it is, there are reasons why people don't do things that God leads them to do. Sometimes it's out of fear. Sometimes it's priority. Well, I've got other things to do. This is going to interfere with my plans. I've got family right now that are more concerned about their earthly career than they are about the business of God. Do you think God's pleased with that? I'm going to go as far as to ask you, and I want you to think about it within yourself. Do you think God's going to continue to bless that? You see, when you run from God, God's got you supposed to be doing something. I know that's not proper English, but you're supposed to be doing something in the Lord, and you're running the other direction. If you think for one minute that God's going to keep blessing what you are doing while you run from Him, it's not going to happen. I've told some of my family in the past, I said, I love you, and I, don't, I, don't, I know you're going to be upset with me for telling you this, but I'm just going to tell you anyway, you better get back on track with the Lord because no matter how much you try, you may get a good job, it may look good, you may be in with the boss and all. Give it some time. Just give it some time. Things ain't always what they seem like. I've got family members that look like maybe they're making good money, but wife and husband can't get along, always on the verge of divorce. 
I don't tell you, when you're running from the will of God, no matter how much your hands and feet try to make it good, God's not going to bless it. He's not going to smile on it. And even if you did have a little bit of happiness here in this life, as far as the carnal flesh goes, running from the will of God, it'll never compare to all of eternity in the darkness of hell. Stand your feet tonight. Oh, I hope I didn't over-preach or preach too much tonight. But my heart's full. And obviously to me, Sister Reba, of course I'd love to have a packed house. But obviously to me, there's got to be a reason why that God keeps. This is the third, maybe fourth time, but at least the third time that God has impressed me to preach on basically the same thing. I don't do that. I'm not, that's not my style. I don't normally preach on the same subjects like that. But God's trying to tell you something. So what I want you to do, I want you to take this very seriously. And I want you to begin to, I want you to brainstorm, heart storm. I want you to think about some areas of your life. Is there something that you've pushed to the back burner and it's been there so long that you forgot about it? That God wanted you to do and it's been on the back burner so long that you've just forgot about it. You haven't even been thinking. You've been feeling that God has been trying to nudge you. Come here, Brother Ben, and feel for a minute. I'm, I'm just going to try to obey the Lord. I want you to sh- I'm going to show you something. There are times, I want you to just stand right here. Just stand right there and face that direction. There are times that God's just trying to gently nudge you and you just you keep staying right there. God's, come on, come on. God's trying to give you the gentle little loving nudge. But you're not cooperating at all. Do you know, I heard this said many years ago, and I'm going to close on this thought with the Lord's help. The devil will push you. He'll pull you. He'll drag you. But God will only lead you. God will never push you, pull you, and drag you. He will only lead you. He will never force you against your own will. He's a perfect gentleman. And when God gives you that loving little spiritual nudge of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost says, come on. Come on, it's time. It's time. If you keep waiting right there and God's dealing with you to do a certain thing, no matter what it is, get saved, do a certain thing for the Lord. God's giving you direction and you just keep stalling or hesitating. If you keep doing that, you're only going to hurt you and those around you and those. Will you bow your head this this evening? Would you help me to pray right here, right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm praying tonight, God, that you'll help our church. You see those that are here tonight, God, those may be listening by the internet that you have dealt with hearts and lives and some have just stalled, hesitated, pushed off the will of God, saying, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I pray tonight, God, that you will give us an assurance of your perfect will, that there'll be no question in our mind as to what you want us to do and how you would have us to go about it. Tonight, I'm asking you this through the precious name of Jesus. I believe tonight, God, you're asking the church the same thing you did Saul on that Damascus road. Why tarriest thou, Saul? I believe you're asking us the same question tonight that Elijah asked those people gathered together. Why halt you between two opinions? Why are you hesitating? Come on to this altar tonight. This invitation's open right now. Will you come right now? Say, Lord, I lay my life on this altar here.